Hello, everyone. Welcome to a brand new episode of Behind Massive Screens. And I'm here today with a guy who I have sat like this, basically, many, many times before. Yeah, this isn't the first time we record yeah. together. No, definitely not. Hi, Frederick. Hey, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, good. Looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. Frederick Thailander, lead game designer at Massive Entertainment. Can I ask you just straight away? Let's just jump straight into it. Let's do it. What does a lead game designer do? I mean, there's a... As there's a top the, level? Yeah, yeah there's, a, the, there's the lead part where you lead sure. some people. That means people report to you and you help them succeed. And then there's the gameplay designer, which I guess we'll talk a bit about today, about, which yeah. is... Well, you know, if I talk to my grandmother, I tell her that I make up the game. That's not exactly <laughs> true, but it's a high level uh, description. So sure. I'm focused on what happens when you press buttons, what happens when things happen to your character, what are the mechanics of the game? Uh, usually at like the minute to minute, second to second layer. Right. I'm not as concerned with the like you know, progression and meta layer and like long term stuff of games. I'm more down into the push button, gun goes boom <laughs> layer of things. <laughs> you yeah, have other teams dealing with those kinds of things. Yeah. And it's 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 a specialization. It's yeah. a it's a um, it's a focus. It's a craft, right? Like different people are good at different things. I've stumbled into the second second part of game making yeah yeah we we've had conversations with people coming to guess the show before about mm. that that specializations within AAA studios compared mm -hmm. to smaller studios yeah but we can return to that later because first sure. i just want to ask how you came to massive what's your journey yeah i i used to work at another big Swedish game dev it's okay. studio. It's okay, you can say it. <laughs> I used to work for, for DICE and I did Battlefield games and Mirror's Edge games for a long time. Um, you know, I started when you could still buy a new Dreamcast off the shelf somewhere at a store. So it's, it's been a while. Um, and, you know, shipped my first games on like PlayStation 2 and helped a little bit on a PS1 game. Ooh. And then, you know, fast forward about... 14 years, you know, I see the uh, see the trailer for for the 2013 trailer for the division. Kind of kind of sparked something. Started to think about what kind of games I want to make, and um, yeah, long story short, I ended up here. I think seven years ago now, so uh, it's been a while now. Yeah. I still feel new, but I guess you know, starting to become part of the furniture here. Yeah, yeah, I know that feeling a bit yeah. too well. Yeah, but. How did you get into the industry to begin with? Oh man, you know I was I was um, I was in university and I was doing a uh, a bachelor of engineering, and then you know all of these cool three D animated movies started happening, and I was inspired. I was like, I I don't want to do this. I want to get into animation. I want to become a three D animator. I want to work at Pixar. But there's no school for that in Sweden, so I'm going to jump ship, work for a while, wait for one of these schools to emerge. But then, you know, fate intervened. I found a job somewhere uh, at DICE or at a subsidiary of DICE and jumped on top of that because I'd done some coding and some stuff in, in my background. And um, yeah, got got caught up in this career instead. Yeah. Um. Jumping, let's jump straight then into the game design part. And let's start from the absolute basics. You have nothing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you, you start have, from scratch. You start from scratch. Yeah. So where do you go from there? Especially as a game designer. Where do you come in? Yeah. What what kind of influence early on? Um, all of that stuff. Like what, what do you so, do on a project that's just starting? Yes. I mean, it's a little different depending on what type of project you're doing. You know, if you know your genre, if you know a lot of things in, in advance, like if you're making a sequel or if you're starting out from like a blank slate. So the approach is a little different. Um, but importantly, as a game designer, that's a phase, right? There are a few phases of, of working on a project. In the beginning, it's a lot of talking and inventing and prototyping and figuring out what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing. 
Uh, later, there's another phase, which is like the implementation phase where you're just working with all the people and, and then there's the wrapping up phase. But in the beginning of the project, you, you, you often start with your themes, right? Like you go really deep into, okay, we're working on the division. So you're like, you're an agent and you wake, you're activated in a mid-crisis New York. So you should probably be able to shoot a gun and jump over things and take cover and scavenge things. Like you start to figure out based on the fantasy that you're trying to sell, you know, um, I guess not all games do that. I, I'm not sure how, you know, jumping in, jumping around on Goombas correlates to being an Italian plumber. So not everybody starts with the fantasy of a certain character, but that's that's quite often the case. We, yeah. we make quite character-driven games. So you start with how do you make that player become that character and what do they need to be able to do to have fun, right? Is that the typical, usually hear about deciding on verbs? Yeah, yeah, like a character. Yeah, as you said. So v jump, verbs are shoot, like yeah, yeah, interact. Exactly whatever. those things, and you know you got your mix of things that come as staples with a genre. You often know kind of what genre you're in because you kind of know who you want to appeal to, and that that's another thing. You have an idea who you're making the game for often at the beginning, even before you know. Like there's anything on screen, you know if you're gonna make a hardcore shooter game or if you're going to make a, a casual uh, platforming game or if you're going to make a really deep card game or whatever. Like you have an idea of both audience and genre even before you know the mechanics, right? So yeah. those things help you decide some of those things. But yeah, verbs. So you, you think about whether or not you need to jump and whether or not you need to be able to climb or drive or all of these big decisions that will then cost a lot of people a lot of time in front of computers for a lot of years <laughs> making them after you've made those decisions. Right. And it's rarely a one man show, right? Like there's a whole there's a there's a group of creative leadership with the creative director and the game director and art director, narrative director, all of these people influence what you need to deliver as the, the gameplay designer, right? Yeah. So okay, so you have the theme, the verb, you have the audience basically yeah, uh, yeah. in mind already. And you talked about let's start prototyping, let's start trying things. Um, but how, because it's not like, or maybe it is, you just <laughs> boot up your engine, uh, in our case, Snowdrop, of course. Mm. Um, you have to have a plan, right? Yeah. Going in. Yeah. Mostly. You, it depends on exactly which mechanic you're doing. Sometimes, we're going to start out with paper prototypes. We, we might make a little board game or a card game or something for, for some mechanic. And in other cases, we just start writing some hypothesis for like, hey, we think it could maybe work like this. Please, Mr. Programmer, will you make it? <laughs> and then I'll try it out, you know, do it cheap because I might be wrong. So that's prototyping, right? Like okay. coming up with some implementable version of your idea that can be tested relatively rough and ready so that you can verify if it's a good idea. And in other cases, uh, frankly, uh, like my first boss said, uh, you know, creativity is wonderful, but theft works. So sometimes you just go, hey, this game does this thing really well. We should do it like they did. Yep. Like not everything has to be super innovative. You know, the, the, there's there's uh, solutions out there. There's tropes. There's expectations. People want reload to work in a certain way or yeah. whatever it might be right so it's a common language yeah. between games yeah so some things you kind of have a hunch how you want to do and maybe they're new maybe they're not some things you you borrow or get inspired or repurpose and some things you prototype some things you just lift from your last game like if yeah. you're the if you're world leading on climbing and you know you're making you've made uncharted then you're making the last of us you're not going to start from scratch again you're going to you're going to use the same tech and the same stuff that you've done before so yeah. that's another way features can make it into a game i i have so many questions here but yeah, I, so. I just want to keep on going a little bit on the practical side of things before mm. we kind of move into the some of the more i don't know abstract stuff about game design but um you mentioned, please, Mr. Programmer, yeah. <laughs> help me in this. It's not quite uh, as simple as that, not, but, you no. know. But uh, how do you work with, and we mentioned, actually, the mm. prog 
progression team and specializations before. Um, how do you, as as the game designer, work together with other teams, say animation, yeah. programming, uh, sound, all of them? Like, how does that come together into one whole? Because yeah, you have the reload, but you need to make yeah, sure yeah. that the program is there, all the animation that. is there, the sound is there. Like, how how and where does the game so designer come into that? Early on in the project, you usually uh, huddle. Like you, you form a little strike team that, like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna sort out what guns behave like in our game, or what the jump is like, or whatever. And who do we need for that? We need an animator, and we need a, a sound person, and we need uh, a coder. And like, you, you gather a little team, and you you work it out. And then at some point later, once you've done all of that stuff, and you usually do that, it, almost like a how do, well, I was gonna say game jam, but you know, that's for game makers. They've made right. game jams. But essentially, you're basically working it out, meeting up, looking at what you've accomplished, talk to each other. It meant like, okay, for the next two days, let's improve this, this, and that. Then you meet again, play it, and like you, you keep iterating on it until you've hit upon how you like it. Yeah. Then later, things become an economy of scale. If you've done a weapon, then it becomes a little bit more detached from making the other 100 and 19 weapons that the game needs then right. maybe you're not as involved it becomes a bit more of a production line the animators do their job over there the audio guys deliver their stuff in bulk from over there so you know it's different phases depending on if you're inventing the thing or if you're just producing more stuff for the for the feature in question right so a yep. little bit different I kind of like talking about as well. We we talked about making like little board games and and paper designs mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Uh, when it comes to how it comes together, because again, we're talking very tactile things. Mm -hmm. We're talking very uh, again animations and shooting and and the feedback yeah. from, on on that. But yeah. the the paper stuff kind of fascinates me as well because I I've. I've I, I remember one point of you pulling me uh, to your desk or back in the old building. It's like, check this out. I'm working on this. And then there's Excel sheets and there's like <laughs> all that kind of stuff that, right. that comes yeah, into that's it. Yeah, that's the unglamorous the, side of game design. Yeah, is... but all the algorithms, yeah. kind of like, okay, how does dam how's damage counted? How does everything, like, how do there's, those, how do you turn yeah. that into... There's, there's no denying there's an amount of, of math and dry stuff that you can apply. Like anything, you can apply anything to game design. Like if, you, if you're if you a physics major, you're going to benefit in when you're a game designer because you can apply how things work, work in the real world to your game mechanics, right? right. And, you know, you got to keep track of things and you got to calculate damage and stuff. And that's that's usually dull Excel work and, and, and stuff like that. So there's a lot of that stuff. And then, of course, actual just paper design, writing, making sure that you're a good communicator that can write things so that three months later, someone can read what you meant and actually make something out of it. That's another like paper skill. But I think the thing I was referring to is like literally mocking things up i anyone who visits um visits massive at any point will see the like diorama in in the lobby oh yeah which is literally someone making hey this is maybe what a scene from the game we should make could look like and then you can we used to uh when we made battlefield games we used to make like a a lego or a clay mock-up and then pull well, not a GoPro through it, but like some camera through it to say like, okay, this is what the first gameplay sequence should look like. And then you have a video of that and you can go and make that. So anything that works, any, if, you know, if it's cut out cardboard figures or puppets or whatever you need to like visualize what you want to make in a cheap and cheerful way, or if it's a dry thing, like just writing everything down in Excel and then asking someone to make it happen, uh, yeah. you know, any tool. I think one of the first time I realized that was I was visiting Funcom uh, mm -hmm. in Norway mm -hmm. and accidentally came across one of their progression um, programmers or designers. And they had a big Excel sheet over yeah. XP amount for right. each level. Yeah. I just stared at it. Like, oh, oh, yeah. God, this is a yeah, lot. Yeah, I mean, you, you look at some of the stuff the uh, that Ada and her team had for yeah. like loot in the division. And like where it can drop and how big the chances are and all of that stuff, uh, you know, I don't understand that stuff. Yes. It's it's it gets really really grocky and and, and nerdy yeah. after a while. 
So before you became lead game designer, like one title mm. you've had here is lead 3C designer. 3C, yeah. I think it's uh, quite a Ubisoft yeah. uh, shorthand. So it's for character, controls, camera. In that order, I think. I, I, I think I say the anyway, differently. Anyway, those, those are the three Cs. Uh, so, um, so yeah, it's it's like a shorthand for saying that you're in charge of what the character does when you push buttons. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, but but how, yeah, how that kind of comes into like those three aspects. Like, what makes, and this is going to be a. I, I guess it's a little bit too big of a or an open question. Mm -hmm. it depends on genre and stuff, but. Generally, what makes like good camera, good controls? How do you, if we have a third person shooter, mm. a hypothetical third person shooter about a uh, post catastrophe New York? Let's say, like, let's say, <laughs> there, um, and how do you make sure that the feel is right? Like, how do mm -hmm. you build that from the ground up? Like, how the camera should move. Like, because movement in that hypothetical yeah. game was really nice. But but this is this is where you get into the actual you part of that because it, it becomes personal and becomes about preference and and artistic expression, right? Like we decided that you know you're playing this agent in the division uh, and you have a certain heft and weight and maybe you're not you know nimble and can climb and stuff like that. And we decided that responsiveness was really important. We started like measuring button inputs to make sure something happens on screen with a minimum amount of milliseconds and wanted to make sure that there was no like, well, a lot of the time you want like inertia and believability and like things, things uh, have weight and it takes a while to switch direction or swing the camera around. But we, we wanted a very, very responsive game. So those are some of the choices we made for that game. Maybe if you're making a different game, you make a different choice. Like, let's say you have a, a Wild West game and you want to have a character that really makes you feel like moseying down the street, and not rushing around like... Uh, hypothetical Western yeah, game. Yeah, hypothetical, hypothetical big Western budget game. Western game. Yeah. Then you're going to make different choices. You're going right. to let your character be, you know, a little slower and a little bit more like real in some sense and how it moves and... And that's a valid choice. And at the end of the day, it comes down to what's good for the game you're making. Yep. Obviously, there's some big pitfalls that you just shouldn't do as well. But it's certainly all about making the right choice for the game you're making as well. Yep. And that can be really hard. And that's why we have you know game directors and creative directors who state those goals. Yep. Like responsive. Okay. Now I know, and now I have my marching orders. Everything we do needs to be responsive. For instance, yeah. So how? So it's basically like how do you do? Like you sit and and move things like small little sliders and and change things in your Excel sheet, or right. how does I mean, that? Like again, we're on the practical yeah. level of of making these things happen now. Th th this is where it's a collaboration between all the disciplines because you know on the one hand you have code that literally reads the buttons and sends them to all the systems in your game that need to do something with the button. But then those things need to be responsive. So you, you might have a really fast engine that doesn't have a lot of delay after receiving a button input. But if your animator makes a very slow and deliberate start to the animation that happens, like let's say a lot of games, when you start walking or when you jump, the jump is a perfect example. You rarely see someone actually do what you and I would do in reality when we jump, which is like, you know, crouch down a little bit and then stamp off. In a video game, when you jump, you leave the ground the, the moment that game has read the button because that's that's responsive. And so it's up to both the animator, the coder, the physics coder, uh, whoever tweaks the buttons. Like everybody needs to understand if something needs to be responsive because you can introduce unresponsiveness at any of those stages if you if you're if you're doing it wrong or if you don't know yeah. what the goals are. And how does that communication come from 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 you and from game design mm -hmm. to the other teams? How do you 
how do you communicate a, a fairly <laughs> abstract idea? Okay, so if I just sit down and say, okay, we need this character be to be more responsive, and then you have all these different teams that have to make it happen. Like, how does that communication flow works to make sure that the end mm. product it's, is what was wanted? So, on the one hand, as game designers, especially I guess if you're um, if you're a lead or you know you're not a very if you're not down in the nitty gritty technical game design track, you you have to have some communication skills, whether they be written or verbal or mime or you know whatever your preferred communication style is, um, because you're going to end up repeating the vision and the idea and the feel to to everyone on the team who's who's um, affected by it. But but there's some tools as well. We um, we. Previs, uh, i.e. make cheap animated uh, mock-ups of what we want it to look like once it's implemented so that we can all gather around something actual visual and and look at it and go, okay, so this is what it's going to look like. Okay, I'm going to go code the thing. I'm going to go animate the thing and everybody understands it even before they make it. Yep. That's a very effective tool. Um, and and ripomatics is another thing where we like will take all of our favorite v examples of what something looks like in uh, from films. So just the coolest punches or shots or whatever from from films and put those together in uh, montages to inspire the team to do the right thing and, and like have the right style about something. That's, that's another effective way of communicating um, those soft values that you're talking about, right? Yep. So going kind of back to the three C's and control mm -hmm. and genre, mm -hmm. uh, which is really interesting and in how you kind of you enter the world of each individual game, even though you have some expectations mm -hmm. and still it deals with with some form of innovation. I mean, how how you've worked on such different games and right. i'm thinking especially about mirror's edge actually yeah uh because Ooh, it, that's a blast from the past but yeah, sure but let's it, go there it's kind of it, it stands out when it comes to movement because sure it's such like movement is basically the game yeah it was the thing that that yeah. game was trying to do so it was first per, at the time it was mind-blowing the first person parkour game mm. basically like which, how, is, which has been done more since, since but it was, yeah. was kind of new back then yeah how do, how do you in, in a place like that make sure that everything how does that process look to make sure that because the one thing i'm not going to claim that a third person shooter is easy to make and the controls is mm. easy to make that's not what i mean but it's kind of there were challenges from an in innovation yeah. like that like that yeah, was so, mirror's edge you know, first of all, you know, shout out to the people that led those teams. I oh, was yeah, working yeah. as a designer on that team, working on the combat and a little bit of movement and stuff like that. Um, but the the challenges were huge. First, there was research, right? We we met up with uh, people who did parkour. We we had um, oh, Sebastian, I think his name is, the guy who runs in the beginning of Casino Royale from James Bond. He consulted on the game martial artist called Krista Wagner consulted on it. So we brought in people that told us what it's like and what to think about. And then there's a lot of prototyping and 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 you got to be very open to what you learn. So one of the things we had to learn a lot about, for instance, is uh, motion sickness or simulation sickness. Like, well, how do you prevent that when you're supposed to like tilt the camera and wall run and roll and do all kinds of things in first person? That that was one of the big learnings. And then, uh, you know, how do you uh, how do you make the player understand the uh, the world and what can be done? And we started having to be really, really careful that everything was like the exact right heights and the exact right distances so it fit. And that's what we call metrics, right? We spent a lot of times thinking about metrics, namely exactly how large things can be. And then we try to hide the fact that our games are big Lego boxes <laughs> or Lego sets, right? Uh, those were those are huge at the time because, you know, we, we used to not make games like that, where you interacted with the world and the geometry that much. Uh, yeah. it, was, uh, it was enormous. And then weird little things like 
having to build a swan neck on our character. Because if, when you look in first person, if, if you just spin the camera right down, you're going to look right in your own like chest cavity and you can't do that. So you have to build you have to build the character in a way that can move the camera around so that you can see your body in a natural way, uh, which is not trivial, actually. No, that, that's one. Actually, it makes me think of. I, I sit here with a bunch of notes that we took during uh, during a meeting before this, and and at the end, jumping from one topic to another mm -hmm. here. But games, uh, games are cheating. Yeah, games are just cheating. It's all smoke and mirrors. Like no game. Like a lot of people talk about realism in games. But nothing in games are real. If we can cheat on how we do physics, if we can cheat on how stuff works, if we can cheat with like, oh, that that enemy is behind a wall, stop processing him, make him not think anymore, <laughs> whatever it is, right? Like bullets don't actually travel anywhere. They just appear in the body of the person you're shooting. Like we're, we cheat with everything. The, the trick is to know how to hide your cheating, right? And make it feel good. Uh, it's like the thing I said before with, with jumping like leave the leave ground immediately that's cheating as well like everything is just uh smoke and mirrors and selling an illusion at the end of the day yeah no it's, it's that's fun sitting in an engine and, and looking at things and realizing just how 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 the puzzle pieces come together from mm -hmm. various things just to build a, a yeah. cohesive believable whole yeah, I mean, I don't know. Speed. I don't know if I can go into that example because no. it's not my my work. But you remember the the um, there was a enemy in the division with a backpack. You I, remember? I was hoping you'd bring this up. So, you know, he had a backpack full of ammo. If you shot the backpack, it started spraying ammo all of, like shooting uh, all over the place. We we didn't have that. We didn't have objects that could shoot guns. So so Drew took a took an enemy, shrunk it down, made it invisible, and attached it to the back of the other enemy. So in reality, it's a little invisible guy sitting there shooting with horrible aim when, when this backpack explodes. is like an invisible uh, mini person shooting from there. And th those are the type of cheats and hacks. I, I mean, I think famously, is it, ha is it Fallout? Where you have like a train riding oh, sequence? Oh yeah, yeah Fallout 3, yeah. And... In actuality, it's like a dude or like a, an NPC walking around with a train-shaped head that you're sitting in because that those were the only things they could make move, right? They didn't yeah. have vehicles in that game. So screw it. Let's just cheat. The, the, if you haven't seen those before and you Google Fallout 3 yeah. uh, train guy, be prepared for a nightmare <laughs> worse than Pyramid Head <laughs> and Silent Hill 2. Um, Trolley Head. Uh, it's, creepy as all i can't say the f word oh, yeah on this games podcast, are cheating. but games are cheating yeah. um if i'm at home and i want to be a game designer mm. first of all what should i think about like any tips and tricks for a budding game designer wow i mean i recruit people now so i can answer it but if i were to answer from my background it would not be valid anymore back in right. the day you could just become a game designer because you lucked into it but now there's school so there's a lot of good education for it both online and uh, at physical universities um but practically just make games like it's never been as accessible to just download an engine like i don't know unity or unreal or or whatever and and try out stuff and learn stuff and jam together some stuff and and make games or if you don't have the prowess to do that you know make board games make uh, card games just start practicing the the thinking about how to make rules and make interactions that are fun for others to do once you give it to them and are not there to tell them what to do. Right. Like that, that's the, that's the leap of faith, right? Like when you make games, you have to make a toy and then not be there to instruct people how to use it. Uh, right. And, and if you practice that in any way, you're going to eventually be a game designer. It's a little bit like they say about musicians if you play music, you're a musician. There's no gatekeeping. 
but to get to the point where you get hired um, at the moment, educating yourself or making some a really kick-ass portfolio of stuff you've made is uh, is the way to go. Yep. I like that uh, you said with the board games there and the instructions, because that's one of the things you brought up when we were talking as well, that gameplay in a, in a video game. It's, it's mm. about explaining rules without sitting there to explain them. Need to be intuitive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, part of it is, I mean, we're lucky to do, have done wor worlds that we relate to. We get so much for free when, you know, it's a, it's a gun and it's a concrete block and it's, it's these things. So you kind of know what to expect when a character is in that situation. And as long as we're delivering on that, we get a lot for free. We don't have to explain to you that concrete stops bullets or that you can vault over, uh, you know, the one thing, but you can't climb up, you know, a skyscraper or whatever, but uh, it's it's harder if you're making something abstract, if you're making a card game, or if you're making something that's very fantastical, if you're making Mario, then you have to spend a lot of time establishing those rules and making sure the player understands them and ease people into it, right? So um, it, it kind of depends on how much you can rely on people's prior knowledge, yeah. which is also a, a trap because... Sometimes you think people know how something works. Oh, it works like this in all other games. But then you're making a mass market game. And you have to cater for people of, of all capabilities to be able to play the game. And, and not everyone knows all the tropes and the expectations and the prior games like you do. Like, is it is it intuitive to throttle a car with your right index finger? on a controller no no it's not but it's how it's done in car games but if you get into a game and you've never played a car game you have to you have to make that intuitive you have to explain that you have to teach it to people yeah. um, and that's an art knowing what to rely on and what to explain yeah uh, speaking of kind of to start wrapping up sadly mm -hmm. um but I also want to take a moment to talk about accessibility, yeah. uh, which has become a, a more and more important for the gaming industry, uh, finally. Yeah. And a lot of games are, are starting to include various mm -hmm. tools. How do you approach, as a game designer again, how do you approach mm -hmm. that from a more holistic kind of view? I mean, I think, first of all, first of all we have to acknowledge that it is um, not at odds, but it is... Uh, so intimately connected to game mechanics design because explicitly we're trying to challenge you. We're trying to do something that is a little bit difficult to do so that when you can do it, it, it feels good. You know, whether it is jumping over a gap as Mario or hitting a target in a shooter game or whatever, like it, it requires dexterity, decision making, eyesight, hearing. We rely on challenging those capabilities. But we also want to include all, everyone in that, in, in those capabilities. So the first thing we do is to think about making sure that anything you engage with can be engaged with in multiple ways. If you're, can we make it so that you can understand where things are, even if you're not sighted? Can we make it so that we communicate where grenade lands, even if you can't hear? so on and so forth. Can we make sure you understand who's an enemy and a friend without being able to see color? All of these things you can do from the get-go without, you know, getting into the world of options or tuning or any of that stuff. You have to think about accessibility uh, when you make the game to begin with. That, that's, that also saves you a boatload of time at the end. And then... Just just learning and meeting and talking to people of various abilities gets you an instinctive insight into how they tackle challenges. Everyone has different challenges. And it makes you start to design things in a way that are naturally approachable. And then obviously, at the end of the day, there's various things that we also need to make as, as options and as extra things. You know, maybe it's being able to skip things or tune certain difficulties or remap controls or toggle between different colorblind modes. And, and those, those things we do as well. But I'd say that the new and modern thing to think about in game design is to design accessible games 
uh, rather than game design accessibility options. Right. That's the that's the way forward. Right. That's awesome. Thank you very much for joining us. Oh, today, my Fred. pleasure. Uh, it's been it's been great. I have I still have questions, but we're, <laughs> sure. we're out of time. And I think uh, Sevak, who's behind the scenes, is going to start waving his hands <laughs> any minute now. Uh, but so blame him, kids. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much. Thank let's, you. Let's do this again. We should. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. And we'll. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.